Blog Talk Radio. Good morning and hello again, everyone. This is Pete Ekstrom, and welcome to the Gold Call Show, the place to go for more insight into the selling profession around the world. I want to thank you for tuning in, and if you'd like to learn more about other Gold Call Show programming and the cure for the common cold call, please visit us on the web at thegoldcall.com. That's thegoldcall.com. Now, in our studio today, we have a very special guest, Gerhard Schwatner, the CEO and founder of Selling Power and Selling Power Magazine. Selling Power is a multi-channel media company that produces Selling Power Magazine and SellingPower.com, which, by the way, offers a series of five-minute video interviews with other sales experts, and it is watched by over 100,000 sales executives. In addition to these ventures, uh, Mr. Schwartner is also the host of the Sales 2.0 conference series. You may have heard of these. Over the course of three decades, Gerhard has interviewed some of the most successful leaders and experts in sales, business, sports, entertainment, and politics, including Mary Kay Ash, Mark Benoff, Michael Dell, George Foreman, Seth Godin, Jay Leno, Bill Marriott, I met him once, very nice man, and Colin Powell. Gerard has personally trained more than 10,000 salespeople around the world and is the author of 17 sales management books. He is also the recipient of the Sales and Marketing Executives International Award and uh, the 2010 Ambassador of Free Enterprise Award. We are truly honored to have Gerhard in our studio today, and so with that, please join me in welcoming Gerhard to the Gold Call Show. Good morning, Gerhard. Good morning. Good morning, everybody in the audience. I feel humbled by this uh, amazing introduction, and uh, I'm here to uh, serve you and uh, happy to answer any questions you have. Well, it's great to have you aboard, and uh Garrett, I've been a, a big fan of yours for a number of years. I, I find your online content uh, in document form, your videos uh, are just terrific, and I've uh, certainly learned a lot from your uh, expert advice. And uh, also it's nice to hear other people talk about uh, the selling profession and success in business. Now, one thing I notice about your uh, background is that over the years you've had several interviews and encounters with uh, notable personalities in business and the entertainment industry, and I, too, have had uh, several encounters with uh, notable personalities in the field of business and the entertainment business. As a matter of fact, a number of years ago I had uh, celebrities like Dick Clark and Christopher Walken, if you can believe it, uh, were customers of mine. And uh, curious, you know, given your interactions with famous people and notable, successful business people, um, which which personality trait do they have that that stands out the most? In, in other words, in your opinion, what do successful people have in common? I think the the letter C stands for curiosity. Uh, they are curious about you. They engage in a dialogue. They, they are, the letter A stands for authenticity. Uh, they are authentic. They don't put up a front. Uh, they're just uh, they're, they're themselves and they're comfortable. And then the letter P stands for passion. They are passionate individuals. They love what they're doing, and they wouldn't want to do anything else in their lives. So if you just think about those those three items, uh, you you can be a lot more successful. Um, curiosity is all about asking the right questions. Uh, when Heisenberg, the Nobel Prize winner of physics, once said, "Nature does not reveal its secrets; it only <laughs> responds to our method of questioning," and that's what you do with your interviews. You ask interesting questions to trigger interesting responses, and then people think better thoughts. Would you say that they're also, well, this probably goes without saying, that they're very driven, uh, very driven and very natural as to how they go about achieving their objectives? Yeah, they're very ambitious. Uh, I'll give you an example. Mark Benioff, the founder of Salesforce.com, and I had a dinner 14 years ago in Monterey, and uh, I asked him, what's your vision for your company? 
And at the time, he had 30 employees, and he says, in 10 years, I want to build a billion-dollar company. And I ask him, how many drinks did you have? And he says, I'm serious. I, uh, you know, mark my words. And uh, we uh, worked together for a number of years, and uh, then he invited me uh, to uh, the New York Stock Exchange when the company went public. And he said, uh -huh. see what, what we have created. And uh, sure, after 10 years, he... Um, had a billion dollar company and now he is a four billion dollar company well you know I, I forget who it says you probably know better than I do the name escapes me but uh, the saying goes if the mind can conceive it the mind can achieve it or yeah there was no, Napoleon Hill and the quote goes ah, like this no, what the is. mind can conceive and, and believe it can achieve Pretty powerful. There's also another saying that I heard. It says that if uh, a person who says it can't be done is right. Absolutely, and I totally believe it. What, what is the secret to your success? Well, I, I, I'm a driven individual as well. I, I set the bar for uh, achievement, and uh, I would say that uh, I set the bar at a reasonable height so that uh, I can achieve it. And when I do, I certainly give myself a sense of recognition. Now, uh, you know, it's often thought that sales professionals are in the business to make money. I disagree. Uh, although money is a major component of business and profit, of course, without it, you can't have a successful business. But I think after 31 years in direct sales that I think, based on my observations, that most salespeople are in pursuit of recognition for their achievement recognition by their peers, certainly their superiors, and they get a sense of satisfaction for being able, being able to accomplish something that they didn't think that they could do when they set out for it, such as Mark Menoff, right? I mean, I'm sure many people told him he was ridiculous in thinking that he could build such an enterprise, uh, uh, certainly within the time frame that he thought. But again, uh, if you don't have a dream and if you don't set a goal, then you wander aimlessly in whatever career path you choose. So for my own personal, uh, uh, I guess the fuel that drives me is uh, I like to get a sense of accomplishment every day, and I certainly uh, get that sense of accomplishment every time that someone purchases uh, my product online and uh, has a good experience with it. And uh, that's what keeps me coming back every day. How about you? Well, I, I'm reminded of what Ken Blanchard once said, that uh, a goal is a dream with a deadline. And uh, a lot of people are just dreamers, and they don't set deadlines. And uh, I, I feel the same way as you do. I think that success is the progressive realization of uh, goals that you continue to expand and, and stretch. Uh, so, it, and, and that's, I think, another common characteristic of super achievers, that uh, they're always creatively dissatisfied with the status quo. They always want to change. They always want to be ahead of the changes and not change when they have to. They change when they can. And because they want to. Yes. Uh, they embrace change. Of course. They realize right. without change that improvement can't take place. And uh, so uh, they're willing to risk uh, failure. Uh, and, and, it fails, and in sales, uh, you know, there's another factor, which is selling skills. Uh, if you're not the master of your selling skills, you will be the slave of your unpaid bills. Say that again. I think our listeners need to hear that. I, it if, caught my attention. Well, you're a musician, and you play the trumpet. And if you don't That's practice, uh, the sound is going to deteriorate. And it's the same with selling skills. If you're not the master of your selling skills, you will be the slave to your unpaid bills. A slave to your unpaid bills. I like that. So, if, uh, in other words, a translation could be: if you don't have a plan of your own, you become part of somebody else's plan. That is that is very very true, and I think uh, salespeople need to practice their skills and uh, need to refocus on their goals steadily. And uh, here, here's the real challenge: I think we're talking about success. We also should talk about the opposite. The opposite of success is disappointment. It's not failure. Uh, any, anybody can experience failure, and, and, and you, we fail forward. Everybody knows that. But the, the 
psychological fallout of disappointment is so disabling to people. So they want something, they want to achieve something, and something unexpected happens, and uh, life throws them a curve. And uh, they start to withdraw from the battle. They start to get depressed. They start to get uh, enraged, and, uh, and their emotions become debilitating to them. And what I have to say to those people who get disappointed or when anybody gets disappointed, you look at it from a 50,000 foot perspective, from a higher perspective, and then you tell yourself disappointment well handled and managed becomes the cradle of ambition. And I've met so many people who suffered massive disappointment early on like Wayne Dyer, uh, you know, he, he uh, talks about in his lectures and his books about uh, the disappointment of uh, not being close to his father, who disappeared, never knew him. And uh, at age 30, he uh, went to the, the cemetery where he was buried, where he found that he was there and was sitting on his, on his grave for an entire day and weeping and cursing and yelling and screaming. And then at the end of the day, he said, I forgive you. And that resolved his disappointment, and he moved on. And that is the hardest thing for many people. Uh, the management of disappointment, if it's managed right, it becomes the cradle of ambition. It inoculates you against further disappointment later down the road. And uh, that is a science that uh, very few people learn during a lifetime, and a lot of people suffer unnecessarily. Now, that, could that be as a result that they really don't know what they want, uh, so they're unable to set a goal to achieve it? No, it's not as simple as that. I went to Harvard Business School, and I talked to Dr. Abraham Selesnik. He's a business school professor and a psychoanalyst, and uh, he explained the, the psychodynamics of uh, disappointment, saying that it's really associated with rage, which is – is a taboo, and uh, we cannot walk around and say, hey, uh, I'm disappointed because then people say, well, um, I have my own problems. So people don't want to listen. Or uh, So in order to resolve disappointment, you want to talk to somebody who is close to you and, uh, and share it and unburden yourself and, and get somebody else's perspective. That's why you have to talk show. You have conversations with people that lead to from confusion to fusion. And that's why people are listening today, because people want clarity every single day. They want to find meaning. Uh, and there's a wonderful book, actually, by Dr. Viktor Frankl. Um, it's called Man's Search for Meaning. And he describes a situation where in Nazi prison camps, uh, people were... Uh, um, you know, divided, he divided them into two categories. Those, the, the survivors, they actually went on with their lives, and uh, some of them just made it their mission to, to plant the garden outside their barracks and, and take care of something else and find meaning in, in that suffering, and they all survived. And people who gave up, they, they died. And uh, same thing, I've interviewed POWs uh, from... Uh, you know, Hanoi Hilton, that uh, some POWs in Vietnam, they spent three, four, five, six, seven years in prison camps. And uh, they uh, had a cell that was maybe three and a half foot wide and and uh, uh, five or six foot deep. And it was really the smallest possible space. And all you could do is, is, is walk back and forth. But then somebody had the bright idea to uh, knock on the cell and then communicate with others. And they had uh, about 800 people in there, apparently. And every one of those uh, uh, her heroes uh, knew the, f the first and na last names of all their other fellow prisoners. Uh, they knew their children's names and their wives' names. And uh, uh, why? Because they were shut off from all the hyper-stimulation that we get in today's society, and they're tapped into their mental capacity. And they were actually teaching each other what they knew, and they formed classes, and they're taught 
uh, you know, foreign languages or they're taught math and physics or geography, and they use their minds in a very creative way. So you can be in very, very tough circumstances and, and then recognize that everything you need to succeed is within us now. I couldn't agree more. I think uh, part of the reason why you've heard the old analogy that people can't uh, tell the forest from the trees in terms of setting an objective and seeing the reality of a situation, I think that you know people are looking sometimes so far ahead to the end result rather than paying attention to the process and the opportunity that is really uh, at the end of their nose, not off in a distance. And so, uh, you know, they fail to recognize that uh, that a lot of what they can take credit for and build a stronger sense of purpose is within reach. But unfortunately, they don't give much credit for that, and they only focus long distance <laughs> on the end result. Right. And when it doesn't so come, uh, let me ask you future. another question. I'm I'm really curious about your name, Ekstrom. Uh, is okay. that Swedish? It is. It is. And do you speak it is Swedish? Swedish. Or should I say, or should I say, Gerhard? Yeah, 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I I remember there's one sentence that I, I was taught in in uh, high school because we had a lot of uh, Swedish tourists come to Austria where I grew up, and I learned okay. how to say Jag Elska Day. Yeah, that, does that uh, does that mean I love you? That means I love you, and uh, yes. you know when when uh, the, the Swedish girls came on on vacation to Austria, you know we we could use one sentence, and and that worked. <laughs> now I have to I have to tell you that that's probably the only Swedish I know. Uh, no Swedish speaking family members in the states any longer, but uh, I do uh, hold true with my parents to a Swedish Christmas Eve where we eat uh, a lot of cheese and a lot of raw fish, which. Uh, you know, having been forced to to uh, to eat that as a young boy, I got used to it, and my goodness, all these years later, I love it. So I can't wait to it. Amazing. But, uh, and what does extra mean? What what does that mean? Is there well, a meaning you know, for? I really don't know. And uh, like uh, my family, like a lot of immigrants that uh, came to the United came to America turn of the century, uh, had their names changed to make them sound more Americanized. So our family name i really have no idea so somehow or other we wound up with ekstrom and uh i've i've been trying to help people spell it ever since <laughs> do you know the feeling i think it's a it's a wonderful country uh, i've been there and uh I, I was so impressed with uh the smorgasbord and the the herring and uh, the fish mm. and the healthy lifestyles and uh it, it's a it's a wonderful country Limpa bread and the bundust. That's the cheese. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> See, now you're I making think... me think of the holidays now. now you, you know something, Gerhard? You've done it for me. I didn't have any Christmas spirit until we went on the air today. <laughs> you take yeah, and it, it, it's, all, it's all related to food. And it, uh, it's really interesting how... Um, you know the, the the smell of food of uh, that you were used to when you grew up. Uh, that smell creates an instant connection to those feelings you had uh, yeah. when you grew up, and and that's a wonderful sort of um, travel back in time where we recapture the sense of wonder and, and enchantment that we felt and the magic of, of Christmas time. And I think that's that's lost uh, in uh, you know when you go to big box uh, retail stores uh, this week, uh, you, you hear all this uh, uh, you know, Christmas songs that that almost sound plastic. You know, they, they don't right. sound like uh, the, you know uh, the Vienna Bus Choir or something. <laughs> it, it sounds fake, and uh, we need to go back to authentic Christmas. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. And uh, now that I'm thinking back to your question about what motivates or drives me to succeed in business, I have to, I, Garrett, I like to eat at fine restaurants, okay? I, I have a love affair with food. <laughs> so I like to go out and close sales, earn the money that it takes to eat at fine restaurants. That's what I like. Uh, and, uh, I'm all for that. Uh, I think it's it's wonderful to uh to have good taste, and uh, there was a Frenchman, uh, Jean Antoine Briard de Savarin, said, um, "A great dinner starts 
with the invitation of the right people. Hmm. That's an interesting thought. Because they bring interesting thoughts and interesting conversations. You know, imagine great food with great conversation. That's really the ultimate. And uh, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm willing to uh, invite some of our listeners, and uh, you and I are going to have dinner with, uh, with uh, half a dozen people. And and celebrate. Absolutely, a, a toast to our success and the a toast to better things to come, whatever they might be in our future endeavors. You know, I'm curious. Uh, how did you, you say? I, I found on your part of your website that you, you're basically a mm-hmm. salesperson. Okay, I, I caught my attention. I, I'm curious, just you know, for people that don't know you as well uh, or that well, and I'm curious myself. How did you get your start in professional sales? Uh, why did you choose a career in sales? And well, it's it's interesting. I, I trace it back. I trace it back when I went to school. Um, that I went to a, a a coffee house in uh, in Salzburg to hang out with my friends. And mm-hmm. at, at one point, there was a a very well dressed gentleman, nice suit and tie, and a uh, little handkerchief. Uh, and he was reading a newspaper, and uh, for some reason, uh, we started a conversation with him, and I asked him, what do you do? And he says, right. I'm a salesman. And uh, I said, what do you sell? And he says, I sell uh, washing machines, uh, washers and dryers. And I hmm. thought, wow, this is, this is uh, unusual, you know, that you have somebody... Um, and, and I said, what, what is, uh, do you work in a store? And he says, no, I do hotel demonstrations. And I said, how does that work? And he says, well, I'm inviting about uh, 50 or 60 couples or, you know, uh, 50 or 60 people to a demonstration. So I have different washers and dryers set up on stage and people in the audience, they listen and I give a presentation and I do it for about uh, you know 40 minutes, and then it's hands on, and then people come around, they look look at the machines and uh, see the quality, see the difference, and then I make a special offer, and in in one day I sell about, and I'm just tra- loosely translating it to dollars, I sell uh, you know fifteen thousand dollars worth of uh, washers and dryers, and I said what. <laughs> I was so impressed, but it, it was not the, the content of the story that really fascinated me. What fascinated me is that the way he spoke, what conviction he had about his product, the total belief that what he was doing and what he was selling was so superior than anything else, without a doubt, without a question. He was so eloquent, well-spoken, Sharp as attack, a uh, great sense of humor, a uh, great presentation, great delivery, mesmerizing. And I was spellbound by what he had to say. I was spellbound by that story. And I mm. thought, what a great, you know, this, is, this is personality impresses me more than anything else I've seen before. And I thought, salespeople are really the economic engine of a country because. If you remove salespeople from from companies, then the entire economy would come to a screeching halt. And in the United States, there's 16 million salespeople. Then they're responsible for a trillion dollars worth of goods sold. And for uh, everybody who's listening who has a job, has a job because there's a salesperson out there making it happen and get the money into the company so they can be on the payroll. Right. Well, sales is not a dirty word. It certainly is not now. I've had some experiences early on in my career when people ask me what it is that I do for a living. I uh, kind of beat around the bush for an answer because I somehow or other felt a sense of embarrassment that I was a salesperson. And, uh, I, you know, based on some interactions I have with people, I get the same sense that they're somewhat bashful about uh, proudly pronouncing that they are a salesperson in a particular business. And so... I don't think that that's right. Looking back, I regret feeling that way, but fortunately for me, I uh, I found my way and was able to overcome that sense of I almost want to call it Gerhard disgrace, okay? That's that that's what I 
felt as a salesperson years ago, all right? Uh, a sense of disgrace, a sense of a lack of achievement. Now, of course, you and I, having had successful careers in sales and in business, what do we think differently today? But we can remember when there was a, you know, being a salesperson was a profession you wound up in. <laughs> you wind up in sales. You don't pick it as a profession. And, uh, but uh, I, I couldn't agree with you more that, uh, you know, every day that millions of items are sold by people who are representing the product or service and they need to communicate the value to a buying market and exchange dollars in exchange for the product and the service, or else our economy would grind right. to a halt. And so, uh, uh, I know when I went into sales, uh, I, I was first in accounting. I find it totally boring. And then I, with the next company, I tried sales, traveled with salespeople, and I thought, I can be better than them. I want to be as good as a, the guy who sold those washer and dryers. And right. uh, I, I tried to polish uh, – myself and improve myself and then uh, over time I found the word enthusiasm is very very important uh, and I have a, a, an abundance of enthusiasm about life and about what I'm doing and there are three uh, the, the last letters of uh, the last four letters of enthusiasm is I A S M and they stand for I am sold myself myself Indeed. Boy, I haven't heard that acronym in a long time. Wow, thanks for bringing that one back. I, I love acronyms. Am, <laughs> yes, a great acronym, you know, because enthusiasm. I am sold myself, I-A-S-M. Oh. And the, the letter C in the word close, take it away, and you get lose. lose. And, the letter, and the letter C in the word close stands for confidence. Oh. <laughs> oh, that's that's great. <laughs> You're bringing back, uh, boy, some old school stuff for me that still holds true today, right? It is, and uh, the new generation doesn't know it, and I think they need to learn it. They can learn it uh, by listening to you, or they can learn it the hard way. Well, wait, let's see. It's always, I guess, a, a good trait of a successful person is someone who's open to taking advice, okay? And uh, you certainly give a lot of it uh, uh, in SellingPower.com, your uh, Sales 2.0 conferences, and Selling Power Magazine. You're a uh, media cornucopia of information to benefit. The well, world. I'm very, very excited, and I like the word cornucopia because it's bountiful, and that's what we are creating right now. We are stopping print. Selling Power in print is done. It's history. We have done it for 32 years. However, we bring Selling Power to life online. And we have created Selling Power Magazine in the cloud, and every month we come out with a new edition where people can see videos together with the text. They can play that. They can share articles on social media, uh, on Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter. Uh, you can email articles uh, to uh, your friends or, or to your colleagues. So it's multidimensional, it's totally social, totally mobile. It works on every Android tablet or every on on iPads and uh and every browser. So I invite everybody to uh go to sellingpower.com forward slash cloud, uh take a look at the sample issue that's there and uh subscribe and uh it's it's not much money. Uh, it's a great investment uh to stay on top of your profession. Right. Great, great value. Great value. I've really gotten a lot from it. In our closing minutes, I was wondering, uh, you know, I, I plan on attending the uh, upcoming Sales 2.0 conference. And uh, I understand we have a, a Sales 2.0 conference scheduled for March 10th in Philadelphia and then uh, something in May out in San Francisco for the left, right. left coast. Uh, closing minute here. Uh, what's it all about and uh, how can people well, get involved? Well, essentially... Yeah, I thank you for asking, and thank you for for the plug. Uh, it is a wonderful experience to be part of a Sales 2.0 conference because we get sales leaders together um, for a day, and we do nothing but talk about how to align people, process, and technology. Uh, there's so much sales technology coming down the pike. There, on top of Salesforce.com, you have probably uh, 2,000 different application choices, and uh, you probably need only about uh, uh, 10 or 12 to accelerate uh, 
the uh, speed of transaction to improve sales effectiveness and uh, and work a lot smarter, not harder when you're in sales. And uh, sales leaders want to discover what are the latest tools, what should I use for improving my pipeline, accelerating my deals, uh, automating my proposals, uh, or getting the, the signature back faster. I mean, there's so many amazing tools that are available, and, and so the, it's a journey of discovery. The other thing is also that sales success is the result of the right mindset, the right skill set, and the right tool set. And when you hang out with other sales managers and sales leaders that have similar aspirations as you do, which is to build a more effective sales organization, and they have similar challenges as you face. So when you get together, the the wonderful collisions that happen where people are running to each other, share ideas, make friends for a lifetime, and help each other win. And uh, to add a further note to that is, as a salesperson, many of us, uh, you know, are isolated islands of business. We kind of run and chase the quota independently. Uh, we don't mm-hmm. basically sell in teams, so there isn't a whole lot of camaraderie other than with people in the office on occasion. But uh, having attended the conference myself, I was pleasantly surprised to run into other. Uh, people uh, in a similar situation as mine. We had an opportunity to speak openly about challenges, uh, success stories, and uh, got to know each other at a personal level. So it was really a lot of fun. So uh, I highly uh, recommend that uh, you take a look at the Sales 2.0 conference, and you can learn more about that on sellingpower.com, sellingpower.com. And uh, if you're on the East Coast listening in, we've got something planned for March 10th, an event not to be missed, that's for sure. Well, that's all the time that we have for today. I'd like to thank our listeners for checking in with us, and I'd especially like to thank our special guest, uh, Gerhard Schwatner, with Selling Power. And again, if you'd like to learn more about Selling Power, you can do so by visiting Gerhard on the web at sellingpower.com, where you can subscribe to the Selling Power newsletter and also view Gerhard's informative video interviews with other subject matter experts on topics related to business the sales profession, and sales management. All righty then, this is Pete Ekstrom with the Gold Call Show, saying so long for now, and, of course, happy hunting.